uh, Janine Johnson, who also is in the audience, is our trust services manager and helps me tremendously with the governance issues, policies and procedures, you know, all the real fun stuff. Um, and <coughs> Tammy Smith and Danny Smith, who are also co-owners of Haleki Aloha, I hired them on as full-time employees, um, and in their spare time, they do everything else, like feeding the lahui at marches. Um, Tammy is our dietary manager, and Danny is our facilities manager, and they're also both the on-site um, caretakers of the actual physical property, and I'll talk more about that also. Um, I don't think, usually when I give this presentation, I kind of have to explain what a lady is, but I think this audience, I don't need to go into that. The one thing I do want to point out about our ali'i is that they did not necessarily keep their wealth traditionally within their own ohana. So if you think about the British monarchy, the Japanese monarchy, uh, the King of Brunei, the King of Mongolia, all of those other countries, they distinctly and purposefully keep their bloodlines pure in a sense, right? They don't want to marry a commoner because they want to keep that aristocratic um, uh, status within their family. Um, but the unique thing about our Ali'i was that they left all of their estates to their Lahui, to their people. So that is a direct, you know, you know, direct conflict normally of what you would think of monarchs doing for their people. Um, so in that sense, that's what makes our Ali'i more unique than any other uh, monarchs, any other monarch um, in the world. Um, <clears throat> again, this is um, something that I share a lot um, when people ask me, what gives them this status? What gives an ali'i their kulama? Um, and it's this direct genealogical ties to the beginning of time, right? If you can trace your mo'oku'ahau, your genealogy, to the most basic uh, moment where Kanaka started, that gave you kulana, and that elevated your ohana um, through your genealogy. I also have other ali'i names here because I wanted to recognize when I was in school, our ali'i started with Kamehameha I and ended with Lady Kalani, and I want to honor all of those other ali'i. So these are just some of the ali'i from different moku that were prior, preceded Kamehameha. I think when I went to a presentation with Carolyn Kehalabad, her dissertation was looking at the genealogical ties pre Kamehameha. And I think, if my memory serves correct, it was about 234 generations before Kamehameha. So knowing that you can trace your genealogy to 200 something generations before you means a lot, and that's what you can. Right, so I just want to acknowledge there were many, many more ali'i before coming now because, seriously, when I was in school, the first ali'i that you learned about was coming now, the first, and that was it. You didn't really know anybody prior to it. Um, then I also introduced an ali'i trust. When I traveled to uh, the mainland or continental US, many people don't necessarily understand what an ali'i trust is. Um, and what I've shared before is our Ali left those legacies to their Lahui, to their people. They did so in a very modern structure called an estate or a will that led into a trust. So you think about um, where do you leave all your assets? Who does your Hawaiian bracelets go to? Um, what about the house that I own? What, where is it going to go? Those all go into an estate. And so we have what a result. Uh, at least, I just listed three here, our estate or trust, the King William Charles of Manila Trust, the Burmese Pohi Bishop Estate, now known as Kamehameha Schools, uh, focusing on education, and the Ligo Kalani Trust focuses on orphan and indigent Haiti. So between Luna Lilo, Hawaii, and Ligo Kalani, these three trusts are still surviving today after hundreds of years and are also very much a part of this social fabric of Hawaii that allows Native Hawaiians to thrive. We've taken a little bit of turns along the way, which I'm gonna share in a little bit. Um, and we've also seen the result of their lands grow. 
So just to give, these are also a little bit ballpark figures. This is probably 2016 data that I've tried to update here and there. Our estate value is the top. So we are estimated at about 18 million, which I'm super thankful for. But in comparison, when you look at some of the other elite trusts established, the Queen's House is by Queen Emma, the Legal Collecting Trust, KS, they are in the billions. And so, specific, I want to point out the Eagle Kaleni Trust because this just happened in the past month. This 700 million was an estimate. The 273 million just occurred in this past two, I say two months. They recently just sold their two Waikiki properties, the Alohilani Resort and the Hyatt on Kuhio, the one that has um, Map 24 7. I don't know what it's Is it a Hyatt? Is it a Hyatt? It used to be the Outer Grip Prince Kuhio, then it's Hyatt. And then the Alohilani was the old Hawaiian region, right? Yeah. That's how old I am. Um, so, in selling those two properties, um, they came into a, a large sum of money. Now, and I won't, and I won't even, I won't get into the, um, my, my personal thoughts about the sale of legacy land. <laughs> But I will save that conversation for later because I, I do want to focus on the video, not anybody else. So this is a slide that I share that I tell people this was all I knew about Lililo before I came into this job. I mean, I, I knew a little bit more. I read the children's book. I knew he went to school with Queen Emma. Um, when I worked at Queens, I knew of that distinct relationship between Kaluo Kau, which is also known as International Marketplace was given to Queen Emma by Luna Lilo. But this was it, right? The six, the six uh, king of the Kingdom of Hawaii, first elected king, that's always a major part of that first sentence about Luna Lilo, that um, his name, William and Charles, honored the British King William and his father, Charles Kanaina, whose namesake is here for this building. And that Luna Lilo came from um, something that his mom, Kekauluohi, who was Kuhina Nui at the time, um, uttered Iluna, Iluna, Iluna Liloloa, the highest, the highest, the highest of them all, almost prophesizing that he would again be king as a Malibu. So his land holdings, um, when he inherited them, um, he inherited them from his mother primarily. Um, his mother unfortunately passed away when he was 10 years old. So in a sense, when he creates this perpetual trust and leaves it for the benefit of Hawaiian kupuna, right? So that specific clause to older people, I actually think it was because he was probably raised by a lot of his kupuna, right? Who, if your parent passes when you're 10 years old, who are the ones that raise you? It's most likely the kupuna or the aunties or uncles in your life. So of those lands that he acquired, that was about 400,000 plus acres. Wow. And to put that into perspective, Kamehameha Schools has about maybe 360,000. Department of Hawaiian Homelands manages and owns about 250,000. So he had the most amount of land acquisitions um, compared to any other elite. Now, after the Great Mohele and after um, what, what was called paying off a lot of the debts, we just help, uh, we just had some of our um, legal team look at title searches for these um, Ahupua and I that we had listed. They could only find records. I mean, of course, this is the first iteration of, of looking at this. They could only find about um, doc they could only find documentation for about fifty thousand acres. So you're kind of wondering, like, okay, where did the rest of it go? Uh, and that's <coughs> my that's our homework of uh, always trying to seek where these lands went to or where they were given to. Um, and so, sorry, I'm taking a little bit longer. So the the, the third bullet is that. He directed that of all these land holdings, you sell enough to make $25,000, and in today's money, that would be about $700,000 to build and erect a fireproof home for Kubuna. And so anybody know where uh, 
uh, what region the original home was at. This, this was a mine, Lunalilo home. Where was the first Lunalilo home established? This was near Pardon? It was near this area. Kind of, right up the street. Roosevelt. Yeah. Roosevelt. 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 So, this is a, a picture of what we have of the original Lunalilo home. You'll notice there are no houses on the mountain. This is kind of like a mini heights area. And last week, Saturday, my Hula brother, who is this avid uh, historical researcher, um, sent me this map. And he goes, oh, Here I am. I found the fire map because his brother is a fireman and he's always looking at old school maps. So, my uh, my dear friend, Ryan Peloso, gave me this just this week and I added it to my um, presentation because what he did was he took the fire map from 1927 and 1927 is the year that we moved, right? So this was probably, a fire map shows and illustrates to firemen what kind of structure it is, kind of the access point, right? What kind of roads you need to take, should there be a fire, which I, I really appreciate. And then he overlaid it with the Google Maps. So in actuality, I always thought that Roosevelt may have been the original site. But according to this map, it's right at the corner of Mott Smith Drive. And he sent me this map. So it would have been right on this corner. So I know if, if you guys ever driven by this, uh, this is a church right now. Yeah. And this, according to that fire map, was where the original which is very, very close to that Makiki Cemetery that has many, many unmarked graves. And um, Sigrid Smith from Kamehameha School shared, um, she lives along Wilder Avenue at the, at the end, and she goes, you know, there's a lot of unmarked graves that are not necessarily you know, maintained very well. But what I asked Nanette Napoleon, so a uh, um, yes, cemetery buff here in Hawaii, is that they probably made that the first indigent cemetery at the time when people started burying in the Christian ways and that it would make sense because of the proximity to the Lunalino home having an indigent um, cemetery. So anyways, this is like super cool for me. Just got it in this week so you can like are the first ones to see it. Not on the presses. Okay. So here's, here we get to the, the interesting part. Okay, so the goal was reached, right? They build a home, they sell some of the land, they build a home. Wow, we have all this land left over. What do we do with it? So they go to court asking for, uh, asking the court's ruling on whether or not to keep all these lands or to sell. And at the time, lo and behold, of this bottom, right? Supreme Court justices in 1883 who made that ruling, one of them happens to be Albert Judd. So if you look at a couple bullets up, Albert Judd not only wrote Luna Lilo's will, but he signed it on his behalf, stating that Luna Lilo was too ill to finish the transaction. And if anybody has ever done trust law, right, if you get if you don't have the notarized stamp of approval, right, it's not <coughs> legit. So just think about that for a minute. Um, the first three trustees of Luna Lilo Trust um, in 1877 were Stanford Dole. That name sounds so familiar, right? <laughs> E.O. Hall and John Watson, right? So if you just think about all those street names in Makiki, there's Wilder Avenue, Mott Smith Drive, Street, Thurston Avenue, you kind of get the picture of who ended up living in those in that Makiki area. And um, this is a picture, this, so this is Kanaina, and so you can see he was actually a member on that Supreme Court, when, um, right? Kanaina, who this building is named for. But that decision was made much, much later, and by that time he was not on the Supreme um, and a little bit about Franz, Albert Francis Judd, he, um, this is from a law student who did some research for me last summer. 
trying to, you know, just to kind of get into the, the, the mindset of who was Albert Francis Judd. So he was the son of Jarrett Judd, who was the first physician, first Western trained physician in Hawaii, um, and was also the court physician, right? So an entree into the Ali'i's most personal and private um, matters. His son, Albert Francis Judd, went to the Ch Chief's Children's School with all of these Ali, left to go um, to college on the mainland, went to law school, I believe it was Neil, um, learned about all these different types of things, comes back to Hawaii and says, hey, Bill, right? I think William Charles, they call, they call him Bill. Hey, Bill, I can help you with this estate thing. This is the newest thing on the mainland, and you know, don't you want to try it out? So he penned the, the will, and he helped make the decision years later to sell every last parcel of his land. Now, when I initially read through all of those Supreme Court matters, it did state that he recused himself from the actual decision the first time. But when it went up the second time, he actually voted. So I'm sure, you know, I want to believe that he was a friend of, of King Lunalilo's and was trying to help him out because this was the latest thing. You know, like if you have a friend who's an attorney, I'm always asking them, hey, can you help me out with some estate stuff or whatever. But I think in the end, you can really see the effects of that sale. So I actually call that, that pearl, that mommy, right, is the true gift of Lunalilo, of kind of what not to do your estate because if you look subsequently years later at Kawahi's will and Lili Wokalani's will, they distinctly say in their wills, lease, 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 no selling, you will not be for sale, lease, 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 whereas in Luna Lilo's it was a little bit questionable at certain times but also sell or sale of lands was dictated in that language, right? And so you know with legal, with legal documents, it's only what's on paper. It's, it's not a lot about, well, let's think of what he would have wanted. That's why it's so important. So if there's any lesson that I've learned in this job in two years, it's I gotta make sure I get my will together <laughs> and make sure that my, you know, my kids know where it's going, where do my assets, I don't have very many anyways, so it doesn't really matter that much. But to have that set up, because that would be one of the greatest gifts you give the next generation. Okay, so uh, I also put this together because when I wanted to look at who were the decision makers at the time for this particular trust and estate, it, it becomes very, very clear. And what I tried to do is layer some of the dates with significant events in history. So the first section, the first bullet point from 1877 to 1904, that's when the overthrow took place in 1893, right here. Um, it was the establishment of Kauai and the Lewis Estates. In 1875, we had the Recipro Reciprocity Treaty, which traded free tariff sugar <coughs> exporting to the continental US in exchange for Pearl Harbor. Um, the second bullet, 1904 to 1926, that's when the sale of the, much of the sale of the lands and the death of the Lewis um, provisional government is ruling at the time. Um, and I also, the third bullet, I broke it at 1926, 1929. That's when Luna Lilo Hall moved out to Mongolia. And at the time, right, fish pond, no roads, well, the Queen's Hospital is right here, and Luna Lilo Hall is less than a mile away. Why would you move Kupuna all the way to Mongolia? There wasn't any colonial on the six main highway. There was no food there was no Costco. So just uh, keeping that in mind. Um, 1927, oh, I, I also put in there, um, 1931, 1932 was the Bassey case. And I know you guys have kind of, you know, I'm trying to think of what was going on in that context. 1930s, the Massey, Massey case um, was huge. and. Also, getting onto the continental US in terms of news chatter and, and the 
fear of the angry Hawaiian um, mom. Um, and then in 2000, 2001, I kind of broke it up to 2001 to today. Um, in 1997, Lunalilo Home actually closed and went under major four-year renovation, reopened in 2001 because we had to do a lot of things like retrofit, put in sprinklers, make sure the, um, the home had handrails for access. I think that's when they installed the elevator, um, many other uh, physical things to the structure. That, how, that original structure is still standing, it's where our offices are. It's over a hundred years old. So talk about, you know, when talk about being grandfathered in, well, this, this building has been grandfathered in. Okay, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna shift up just a little bit because I am a, a hula practitioner. I gotta add stuff like this in because it's just so uh, has so much pinina to me personally and to Luna Lilo. So Luna Lilo's land of Big Island included the Ili of Kea, which at the time went from Puna, where um, where the 2018 lava flow started, but I guess the past the United States, but that general area of Puna, all the way to Waiakea. So if you think, if you've ever driven in Hilo, that's a pretty expensive. So think about going all the way up to the mountain and then all the way down to the sea. And all the way down by the sea is Haena, which is considered the birthplace of Hula. It is where Hiiaka and Hokoi did the first exchange for Mea Hula. And so I was very privileged, I went to, uh, twice in my life I visited this place. And it's still owned by the shipment Ohana. And that uh, 70,000 acres now is, I think, whittled down to about maybe 20,000 acres in that Ahupua of Kea'au that the shipment still owns. Um, in 1882, the shipment, the elders and the Damons, bought it together jointly. And then over time, the shipment bought out the other two and ended up possessing that whole um, island. So if you think about it, the Mauna Loa Macadamia Nut Farms are all over there, on the Abazoo. Um, and in 1996, they sold uh, the Kea'au property for $5 million to Kamehameha Schools. So while I think it's awesome that an Ali'i Trust is also taking back another Ali'i Trust land, they had to pay the $5 million for it, okay? So, uh, anyways, I just have to put that in. So. Um, sorry, uh, the Sea of Nanahuki is that ocean out there. The picture there is the aquifer, and then just beyond this picture of me and some of my good friends was this rock that stood in the water. And every time the waves would move, it would almost like dance. And so that's the rock that they would call hokoi, uh, hokoi wahine amikai, right? So you're dancing in the sea. They told me it was taken out by the tsunami. Uh, years and years ago, um, but that rock somehow is still underneath. I don't know if you can see it, if you scoop it over or anything, but, but in a way I'm also glad that it's hidden and that it's not something that people would take a boat up to do on a tour. So then I also put in here, this is the aquifer that sends fresh water out into Namhenki. Well, 
So this, I just put up, I mean you can't see the names too well, but you can see how now they're getting parceled. This was Kapilani Raceway before, now it's Kapilani Park. But all of those names in blue are James Campbell, uh, Sergeant Seelig, William Bailey, um, Agnew, Flagger. Okay, so you know it's his long name. Okay. Um, and then again, I want to highlight Lilo as a person. So not only were many, many that I visited for him, but there was by him. So when we think of, you know, like, oh, that's the Namanie Hall, or the Lilo Kalani Pitch Perfect. I actually think that Lula Lilo had that skill set too. He knew how to devise poetry, he knew how to compose. And if you've ever, how many, how many of you have ever taken a plane on Hawaiian Airlines to the continental US, right? So you have Kusone singing no Keanu Ahiahi. It is like the theme song of walking on board a Hawaiian Airlines airplane. And Ale Koki, I'm sure you've heard before, is kind of that standard song played at almost every um, UAL. And Ale Koki, I'm going to focus on this for a minute. So this shows Luna Lilo's intelligence right here. Um, and of course, I've taken this from Koki Hei da Silva. Um, when he posted, these are fact sheets from Halamu Hala Ilima when they did all, I think, 17 verses of Ale Koki. They did it as a kahiko mele and they did it as a awana mele. Uh, Ale Koki is about the failed union of Luna Lilo and Kamamalu. So, Victoria Kamamalu was the sister of La Kapua Iba and Alexander Liho Liho, right? So, King Kamehameha fourth and fifth. Luna Lilo was betrothed to their sister. And as scandalous as Hawaiians. We don't need Korean drama. We get our own drama, right? So, Kamal Malu was found in a, and this is the exact word, in a compromising position at a party with uh, Captain Montserrat, right? Like Montserrat Avenue, right? Yeah, he kind of right? Okay. Um, and I think all bets were off at that point, like, sorry, I'm not American. And I also think that with a little had this deep, profound affection for Queen Ella. After King Kamehameha the first passed, he asked for her hand in marriage. She refused. Um, but you know, I think that always was a, was a, a reason. But it, this particular song, if you look at the composition, it shows his mastery of English literature and poetry through the things like a dramatic monologue, lover's complaint, but it's also very much Hawaiian in the sense of language, using proverbs like olelo, eo, native symbolism, intricate wordplay, and pin terminal. So it's like linked assonance. Like, so the ending of one line trigger is the same word as the beginning of the next line, which is a very Hawaiian way of composing. And it talks about traversing the ahupua'a with the world, which is the home of Alexander Nico Nico and Queen Emma, right? A summer palace. So I just throw this out here because most people don't know that he was this very witty, very um, you know, literary scholar. And in a way, right, look how long this song has survived. If you want to get revenge, like Beyonce did with Becky and the Good Hair, <laughs> you put it into a song and you let it live on forever. And that kind of is the best revenge. I, when I give this talk, I, I give this talk and I forgot, um, what, I, I called it Vanessa with the good hair. And one of the kids in the audience was like, Auntie, it's, it's Becky with the good hair. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, sorry, not Vanessa, it's Becky. But yeah, dirt shade, in a sense, dirt shade, right? Okay, so now we get to the, the final section, which is the part that uh, kind of excites me the most. This is what I'm going to redirect, right? So, he was this great, great legacy that still leads on today. And to me, that, those positive influences that he had in the society are the ones that are going to make the most difference. He was um, an advocate, not just for his people at Kupuna, but he was also the first one who defended Pearl River from American interests. So once he found out that um, 
the people did not want to concede Pearl Harbor to American interests because they kind of knew what was going to come next. And, uh, he defended that and he kind of held them at bay. And then you can see subsequently what they did to Kalakaua to get that, right? The Bayonet Constitution. Um, and before I go into this, also one more thing I want to share was that um, it was so important for him to be the first elected king, I believe, because at the time the Constitution, uh, he, he changed the Constitution when he became king to say that everybody could vote and not just the landowners because he, if you think about who the landowners were at the time in the 1850s, they were not Kanaka. And so he wanted to be sure that the people elected him and not necessarily, uh, you know, just by birthright, even though he did have the birthright. Um, so his legacy, Kaupanekukuna, that's also the name of our strategic plan. Um, and our vision is for a nurturing and vibrant Kaupane for all Kukuna. Kaupane, we use that very loosely in like a village or a um, smaller Lapui in a sense. These are the values that are dictated to us. Um, and the ones that we follow and how we provide that care for kupuna. So aloha, ho'ihi, respect, ho'omalama, and patience, malama, caring, kulia, yikapono, striving for what is right, laulima, collaboration, working together, and loko mai ka'i. Loko mai ka'i is generosity, um, and it's star because that was his middle name, that was his nickname, that he was this generous king who really knew how to contribute family and Lahui. So this is the 10 year plan that I am tasked with. It's very broad, it, uh, it's very wide spread and generic, but it's good because I get to figure out the, the little mechanics of that and the pieces. And uh, I get to share with you kind of what we've been doing for the last maybe year and a half, two years. Um, we have three specific programs. So we have our residential care, which is where somebody lives 24 seven, 365 days a year. So we are in constant operation. We also have daycare that from Monday through Saturday, you drop off your tutu at 6.30 in the morning, pick them up as late as 5.30. And we also have hot meals. So we don't deliver frozen meals once a week. We deliver hot meals every day. And sometimes these are the only meals that some kupuna are getting these are some of our residents at the Gabby. Um, so this is probably the first thing that I did. No, uh, yeah. I did a couple other things, but this is one of the first major things I did to transform kind of our space. And so I wrote a grant, uh, it's called Kipuka Omakukuna, because when you come to Unalilo, there is just something magical about that space. And it is a little Kipuka in the middle of residential Hawaii Kai. We're bordered by houses on all sides, and then Kaiser High School is on one side of that border. We got grant funding to build these standing garden beds. We have about 12 of them. And then I hired Tammy and Yanni and their expertise in Aipono, and, um, traditional Hawaiian diets. And what we did was we started growing our own food. So we grow our own kalo, we have eggplant, we have squash. And when I first, when we first built this, I was like, oh my gosh, oh my God, this is so dry. Have you ever seen that uh, cocoa head? It is so dry. Um, I was like, nothing's gonna grow here. But for some reason, they magically grow. It's all organic. We don't use any pesticides. And I think it's because this kalo knows that they're being grown for the consumption by kukuna. And Auntie Tami and Uncle Danny are like the, uh, the best ones to articulate that we're not just physically feeding kukuna a meal or three meals a day and two snacks, but we are actually feeding them at all and that we're feeding them spiritually. And we want to give our kukuna the foods that they grew up with. So these are, our average age is 88. And if you think of the foods that these kupuna grew up with, they grew up with poi on the table, right? The shared poi bowl for their families. They grew up with reef fish. They always talk about menue, kala, beke, and the la, I mean, I remember going fishing with my dad for beke, and now I think there's nothing. Like the last two trips, when I was maybe 15, there was nothing, we got nothing. 
fish that. Um, and of course, the third thing that they always request is like corned beef hash and hot dogs, but we can't always give that to them. <laughs> this, this is, they, they go, you know, I've got more time. You know, like we, we have corned beef every day. I'm like, okay, well, you realize how much sodium that has? Like, what about spam? I'm like, mm, we have bacon. Like, yeah, that's turkey bacon. <laughs> we have to try to be. So we also have this compelling moonlight under the Kiyami tree. We transform the garden. So this is the picture on the left, that's from the garden that's right now. And then on the right is a picture of us having events in the back. So utilizing that space for guests, for kupuna, to be able to really have a magical experience back there. The other thing that we are directed was having an urban emu. So this is my friend. Uh, uh, Mahi and his father, who coincidentally also used to work as a gardener for uh, Luna Lilo Home back in the day. Um, you can bring, and um, this is free advertising, uh, you can bring your turkey on Thanksgiving Eve, stick it in our ibu, the next morning pick it up and take it straight to your potluck for Thanksgiving, you don't have to cook. Um, and for an additional twenty uh, $75, you can add in Auntie Tammy's Ono meal, which is poi biscuits, ulu and kalo stuffing, uh, gravy, rum gravy, and pumpkin okay, French. Yeah. So those are, oh yeah, oh, ulu mashed potatoes. Yeah, yeah, sweet potato mashed potatoes. So it's mashed potatoes, stuffing, poi biscuits, and starches, um, uh, gravy, and dessert. And we've also started uh, participating in the Hawaii Kai Christmas Parade because, wow, it's on Luna Lilo Home Road. <laughs> and last year is the first year that we ever participated in this parade. This parade has been going on for 40 years. Um, and I was a little ashamed that we never participated. And we have this great relationship. I put this slide up because we have this great relationship with the Hawaii Kai Lions Club who uses our facilities for their clubhouse meetings. But I have to tell you the story on the bottom right, so this is Auntie Mona. Um, when she was in the band, we were, she just kind of, I remember going, like, when, whenever they're in the band, they think they're going to a doctor's appointment or a lab test or, you know, just like, kind of like you know, taking care of business kind of stuff. And then when we told her, oh, no, Auntie, we're gonna be in a parade. We're gonna be in a parade at in Luna Lilo Home Road, she's like, well, baby, and let me put on my eyebrows. <laughs> so this is her putting on her eyebrows and her lips. And let me tell you, she did this parade, like Pau Queen wave the entire, what is it, three miles out the side of the van. So again, it's trying to get our kupuna to become participants in our community and for our community to also get to know us as well. That was the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. And you should see, like, I brought my kids walking the parade, they have bubbles. I mean, I was like, oh, that's gonna be cool. The kids will be the star. No, the, the tutu were the cutest ever. And um, I'm pretty sure one day they're gonna make parade marshal. So I'm working on it. And then some of the last, uh, just a couple more slides. Uh, we're trying to create a better environment. Um, I've, I've been talking a lot about public health, and of course, we're a healthcare institution. Um, the sh we have these shipping containers that were on our property since 1997, and they didn't really store anything of true value that we couldn't put up in the hive. So they, they were removed in March, and in its place, we planted about 40 ali bushes. We did plant some lehua, but some lehua didn't do so good. I think it's the dry um, I mean, lehua very sometimes and dry on the road. Um, lemon and mamaki tea. So mamaki tea is always used at our tea with tutu events. So we have high tea where we dress up our tutu, we dress up the dining hall, right? And because the, these are tutu that don't don't necessarily get out, they can't go to high tea at the kaha or wherever the fancy stuff. So we bring the fancy stuff to them and we have volunteers who sign up for tea with tutu. Um, we also last year changed all of our light fixtures to LED. Um, we're looking at a potential cost savings of about $2,000 to $3,000 a year just on energy costs. And with this new LED lights, 
It also, you can turn it, I mean, I mean, we're talking about like lights, but the, the gray lights versus the yellowish versus the peachy pink lights also affect kupuna and their sleep and waking patterns. So we're able to kind of adjust lights according to the time of day. So like when we're there in the daytime, it's the white, right? But we can change it to evening or we can change it to a little bit darker. And then the most recent one is that we went smoke and vape free on campus, which is has been difficult for some, but um, really with the, the, the aspect and keeping in mind that kupuna are our priority and the dangers of secondhand smoke, we all see the vaping dangers in the news these days. We wanted to make sure that our kupuna were safe and healthy. All right, so second to the last slide, my penultimate slide is going to be the most awesome, of course. So in the past year, um, for the first time probably ever in the history of the trust, we acquired a parcel of land, and it's adjacent to our current property. So let me tell you the story about this. So I get a call on a Sunday from Tammy saying that there were some Chinese and Korean developers in the jungle property. We called it the jungle property because it was always the one with the overgrown trees. Always mango tree falling, rubbish falling on our side of the fence. So I wrote a letter, an impassioned letter, about the potential for us being able to put in a bid. And of the 40 bids that they had, they selected us to sell it to them. Um, and then I have to go find <coughs> the money, <laughs> find, get the approval of my trustee. Um, and really, um, at every step of the way though, uh, like you could not believe the whole Ilona that happened with this acquisition. So this property is at the end of our driveway. Like that property literally is where our driveway ends on, on the campus. And so we were like, okay, well, couldn't have picked a better site. Um, and if we were to do any development on site, the two things that, um, that Craig T. Wright told me, who's the head of the Hawaii Housing and Finance Development Consortium, um, you need cooler capacity, right? Because you need extra toilets, and you need a secondary access point or a fire exit to be able to have large semi trucks offload the materials. So then I was thinking, hey, this might be it. So, I would not recommend purchasing a house in less than three months, but that's what happened. Um, and so the first acquisition of land is kind of a landmark for Lina Lino, who lost every single last bit of original land. Uh, so, that was what we did. So, in the end, uh, Iluna, 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 Lilo Loa, to me, his greatest gift is um, kind of this legacy that he's left. It's been um, a wonderful journey. This is, of course, you guys know, right from Kitty Corner to the library. Luna Lilo is buried just across the street, so every time I drive by, just a little way, a little mm -hmm. um, He is buried there with his father, Kanaina, again, you can still get his name for. Um, and there are two other plots on the side. One is Miriam Kekaulo, he's a descendant, and I totally blanking on the other great site. I'm gonna remember that, that's not gonna work. Um, but every year we open up the uh, tomb to the public on his birthday on January 31st on the least, the closest Sunday to his birthday. Um, and really looking, looking at what I learned about him, you know, for the first 45 years of my life to now is, this is remarkable that even though he reigned for such a short amount of time, he had this huge impact and really just kind of laid the foundation for many, many other events that you see Kalakaua and Lili Uokalani um, having. And um, he, you know, I think he tried to, um, you know, sway and keep the American interests at bay, but not really being able to fully fully do that because he died really early of tuberculosis. Um, and so when we think about the effects of infectious disease 
on RLE and how that limited their ability to reign justly. Um, it's one reason why I remain true to healthcare, right? And, and taking care of ourselves and leaving our, our good health for us to do the good work is one of the greatest things that we can do. So I leave with that. Um, may you strive to embrace, cherish, and preserve these values so you too may live in a life of value, which is what I think Luna Lilo did in his short, short lifetime. But um, he, you know, my job now is to tell his mo'olalo and to share all of that manao that I that I that I'm just totally interpreting because I didn't know him personally. Um, but really to also set, tell you that mo'olalo so that you can share these stories and that um, it can be just common knowledge about what we know about the other Ali'i. We should know all the stuff about the Luna Lilo too. And so and that's that's my mo'olalo. Thank you so much for listening on a Friday night. And um, if you have any questions, you can always, you can ask me, you can ask Ivalani or Janine. <laughs> and um, mahalo, mahalo for your time and for listening um, to me talk about one of my heroes. He's, he's, he's my guy. <laughs> so mahalo, thank you so, so much. <laughs>
score, right? So this is, this is we talk about this. I won't go into what I'm, what I'm implying, but it was legal, but it was not necessarily ethical because the lands were sold for under fair market value to friends of the trustees. And that's what we're researching now. How much? Oh, I forgot to, I forgot to tell this story. Yeah, yeah. I forgot to tell this story, the, the Black Point story. Okay, so, you guys have time? Okay, you okay? So, I have friends who went, to, I'm a proud UH graduate of the MBA program. My friends are in the Scheidler Executive MBA program. So they go to this event at Black Point at Jay Scheidler's house because for whatever reason, the president's house in Manoa is not available, right? So my friends tell me, they walk into this area, right, nice courtyard pool. Welcome to Jay Scheidler's home. Thank you so much for coming to this event. I have to do like a MBA school event. And as you may or may not know, this is the former home of Sanford Dole. And I was like, whoa, stop there. So where was this house again? On Black Point. And if you've ever seen a geographic map of that coastline, right? You have Leahi, and you have that outcropping known as Black Point, which is this sheltered, awesome spot of land that you can see all the way to Mauna Lua, right? Mauna Lua is named Mauna Lua because of the uh, Mauna, uh, the East End, and Leahi, right? It's bordered by those two Mauna. So now, yeah, just, you know, just think about it. Like, who would have thought? So, Sanford Dole had the first hmm, black point that was originally in the middle. Right? And then if you look all along different parcels, I'm sure you could find out who acquired the property all the way to Kakabu, Pololo, right? And it's border, and Kahala, right? Black point kind of borders Kahala. And then at some point, Kauai's lands took over, right? Because Kauai is Kahala. So yeah, that and, and that gone shipment. Every every single island, the land was sold. So no, there's a whole lot of money all that stuff. Anyway, that's yeah. Not oh yeah. Necessary. Well, yeah. You know, if you read or go back, yeah. yeah. So that's what we try to start. John Kelly, Marion Kelly. Marion Kelly. Marion, oh. Okay, that was the third house. So the family was there and it was a Hawaiian fishing village. We are saying that the first one was there. All of those wines are, if you didn't do by point, you can't get in there now? Nope. Okay, we used to go up there before because we were kind of grandfathered in. There was that little tiny beach over there. With the uh, saltwater pool. So, and then there was still issue with Kaiser developing at the time in the 60s. So, yeah, 
because yeah. yeah. they basically dredged the fish pond. I, and so this is more modern things. I remember, so where the peninsula is built right now, which are the, the condos that look like San Francisco, yeah. um, I remember that being a sandbar. Yeah, and sandbar. my cousins would ride their bikes <coughs> down to the sandbars and fun around. And then when I went away to college and came back, that those, that peninsula towers went on. I'm like, they filled in. What happened to the floods? 